Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this, the 10th meeting in 2015 of the Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee. Can I welcome all members? Uh, can I remind everyone, please, to turn off or at least turn to silent all mobile phones and other electronic devices so they don't interfere with the committee's at work? Uh, we have apologies from Joanne Lament, who's hoping to join us uh, shortly. Uh, item one on the agenda, uh, we're continuing to take evidence on our inquiry into internationalising Scottish business. And I'd like to welcome to give evidence Graham Blackett, who is the Director of Bigger Economics and the author of uh, a report by N56 on uh, export-based growth, global competitive advantage from the Scottish brand, which was published in February. So welcome, Graham. Thank you for coming along. Um, we've got about half an hour uh, for this uh, session, so I would ask members if they would to uh, keep their questions uh, short and to the point, and answers that are as short and to the point would be helpful in getting through the subjects in the relatively short time we've got available uh, to us. Can I maybe just start off um, in relation to your call for an export-based growth strategy, I think, which is a, an ambition many people would like to see realised. Um, you talk a bit, about, a bit about the Danish model. Can you say just a bit more about how that works in practice and what are the features of that you think we could copy here in Scotland? Yes, well, I think there are probably many, and although I was the lead author of, of this report, we also worked with a team of uh, international consultants, including a firm called Damvad, who are, um, who are in fact Danish, and Kasper Lundgaard, who I worked with there, actually led, led the process of the development of the, the Danish globalisation strategy. Um, I think I think what's quite interesting about Denmark is in development economics we talk about getting to Denmark, you know, so it's often seen as uh, you know the the ambition in terms of uh, what countries want to achieve. But ten years ago they thought they needed to do better, and uh, globalisation more generally was um, how, how they thought they needed to do that. I, I, I think there's maybe two main lessons we would draw from from the Danish experience. One is the way they went about it. So they had a very collaborative process where the Prime Minister chaired a group, but that group was made up of business figures, it was made up of your know, trade unions, um, what, what we would call here civic society, as well as public sector. And th they went through a process that lasted two or three years to identify what, um, how people wanted to see the country develop and what policies were required for um, internationalisation. So that, that, that's one of the lessons. The, the other key lesson is that um, there's no easy answer to this. It's not like you can do one thing or two things and suddenly um, a, a, a performance improves. And in fact, the Danish globalisation strategy has got a grand total of 350 policy measures in it, which I think maybe gives an idea about how, how complex that it is. And actually, many of those are not things that would obviously um, come to mind when you think about exporting. You know, a lot of it's about education policy. Um, and that's because they recognise that um, productivity growth is really what it's about and that there's a, a strong correlation between companies who export and highly uh, productive companies, which um, I guess when you think about it, it's fairly obvious because if you're competing in global markets, you need to be very, very, very productive. So, so that's, that's why it's uh, good from a business point of view to look at exporting, but it's also why it's good from an economic policy point of view. Um, because the most productive companies tend to be the ones that, that, that export, and to export you need to be more productive, so it, it, drives, it drives economic growth. Okay. Thank, thanks, thanks for that. And it, we've done quite a lot in this inquiry as a committee looking at uh, the role of organisations like SDI and UKTI and how they interact and the support they provide. I mean, do you have a particular view on how they're, how they're performing and what might be done to, to improve them? Well, I mean, I guess they have a particular role in terms of helping businesses understand market opportunities and, I guess, in helping and introduce businesses to particular contacts that they might need, say, to, to develop distribution channels. So you know, I think they do a good role in doing that. But I think I'll probably come back to the point about this being a much wider issue. Um, and you know, while, while that's necessary, it's not sufficient uh, in order to, to export. Uh, and I think maybe the, the, the other thing to note about the, the, the organisations and how we tend to think about exporting, that there's almost a need for, a, for an attitude change, is you know, I think a lot of businesses think that exporting is complex, 
and you know, sure there are things you need to consider, um, like exchange rates, like cultural differences. But uh, really, export is just about selling your goods and services to customers. You know, so if you, if you just think about it like that, um, sure, you need to think about the complexities. So um, we have to be careful not to overcomplicate it. Right. Thanks for that, um, Dennis. Rob. Uh, thank you, convener, uh, and good morning, Graham. Um, <clears throat> your report primarily focuses on the role of government, uh, and, uh, and I'm just wondering. Um, where do you think the role of the private sector is in actually taking forward this of internationalisation of exports? Say, for instance, the role of a SCDI or indeed the chambers. I think the the, the private sector has <laughs> has a very important role. I mean, it's um, the people the, be the people who benefit should be the people who um, who drive things. And we do actually mention a couple of areas where. Um, there is the role for the private sector, in particular collaboration between different companies. Mm. And uh, much of that, I think, is in practical areas like access to distribution channels. So, you know, there are some um, larger Scottish companies who've got very well developed uh, distribution channels um, in, um, uh, in most countries in the world. And uh, it'd be interesting to see whether they might be prepared to open those up. To, to perhaps smaller companies because you know, there's potential potential uh, advantages to both. Uh, um, obviously, for the small companies, it provides a way into the market, but also for the large companies, it allows them to offer you know, a wider range of products to their customers. I've heard some examples of some of the SMEs, you know, collaborating, coming together. For instance, if we look at Arin, you know, and, and their their products from Arin, you know, they'll get together and maybe fill a container for for shipping that sort yeah. of thing. So it does happen, but. Um, I, I'm just, you know, trying to tease out a wee bit. I mean, in terms of the role of, say, SDI, uh, SCDI or the chambers, um, we were in uh, Aberdeen on Monday and we were speaking to the uh, uh, Aberdeen and Shire chambers, um, and they seem to collect, they seem to sort of get together with, say, London chambers in in taking their initiatives forward, say, for trade missions, but they don't seem to join up with SDI or UKTI. Why would you think that would be? Um, yes, I mean, <laughs> uh, I'm not. I'm not sure to be honest. Um, the I think may, may, maybe the thing to that might help explain it is the, the companies that tend to export. So you, 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 you tend to export because you've got a particular area of expertise, and you, it, it might be that you're the only company in your area or in your country that has that area of expertise. So, so that you're. Uh, in terms of collaborating with people who are close to you, that might not be possible. So you might need to look further afield to, mm -hmm. to, to find those partners. So you know, it, it, it could be that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But it just seems that we've got this partnership within the private sector, you know, within the chambers, but they don't seem to engage in terms of partnership working. Uh, it's there, but it doesn't seem to be um, joined up particularly well. So you've got the private <coughs> and, say, government agencies working together. In a, in a collaborative and cooperative way. Do you think that's the, the, the area you're sort of referring to that there needs to be this sort of cultural change? Um, I think so. But, and and there's, there's, there's certainly room for more collaboration, but it could also be that they're, they're simply working with different sets of companies and you you know, so that there's not always a need to, to collaborate. So you know, the public sector agencies may be working with companies that have got less experience of exporting as the chambers may be working with companies that have more experience, in which case they may be doing slightly different things. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and just lastly, convener, um, with, with reference to the, um, the the SME sector, do you think that the, w within the private uh, area that that's probably the route that they've got the, the greatest potential, or do you think the SMEs uh, would have uh, a, a more opportunity working through, say, SDI or UKTI? Um, I, think, I think it's probably different for every individual company. So for, for, for some small companies, it, makes, it, make, it would make sense to tie up with a, a larger company that's in a, um, that maybe is targeting the same market with a different product, mm -hmm. um, while, while, while for others it may be more sensible to group together with the public sector agency. So I think it, re it really depends on the, the product and service and the individual company. Okay. Uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Lewis McDonald. Uh, 
Uh, your report follows hard on the heels of the report by the Wilson Review into support for Scottish exporting. And I wondered just what conclusions you drew from uh, Brian Wilson's uh, study that, that, that informed your own work. Well, we, we don't refer specifically to that, but I think I think what we're saying is probably consistent um, with th those recommendations. And uh, um, I guess what we did, rather than rather than look at other work that had been done here, is we focused on looking at the overseas examples. So, so ho hopefully, both of those reports contribute um, something to the committee. The, there was a specific one of the, one of the headline recommendations coming out of the Wilson Review was around uh, a single portal approach, a little bit in line with the question of public and private sector but also the public sector agencies UKTI and SDI yeah. having a single portal and, and that being clearly flagged is that do you think that's consistent with what you're um, saying about yeah. the, the way Scottish exporters are engaging with other people I, I think it is although you have to be careful when you put these things in place not to increase the complexity you know in, in terms of the way it's implemented so the principle is right but, but uh, care needs to be taken in implementation. And, and, and associated with that was a recommendation around access to export finance. Uh, again, do you think there's a, a specific uh, benefit to be had from... Uh, I mean, uh, yes, that? Yeah, that, yes, that's certainly, it, it's certainly a value. Could lead to access to finance is a broader issue, but uh, uh, for, for export and is... Uh, we have British export finance at the yeah. moment, and Wilson Review saying... A Scottish export finance as part of that would be a value. Scottish yeah. exports would, yeah. would be valuable. <clears throat> how, how would that a question of a single portal approach? How would that do you think relate to your points around the brand and um, how yeah. Scottish goods for export are, are, are advertised? So it, well, it, it may be an opportunity um, to, to to find a way of realising the the recommendation of of the development of the brand. Um, and I, I think the, the, the examples that we looked at are set out in the report, but, but I think what's striking about them, particularly if you look at New Zealand and I think Finland as well, that, that what they did in ter terms of their brand, it wasn't like they got marketing consultants in to design a brand for them. You know, the, <laughs> the process was, uh, yeah, and I, I think we, we call that a kind of realistic and authentic brand as required. They, they went through a process of, again, a collaborative process within their countries and invited companies and actually other organisations as well to contribute to the process about where where they would like to see the country going and what they felt the, the, the country offered to the, the world and the brands were kind of based on that. And so in the, in the case of New Zealand, it was the idea of 100% pure. And in the case of Finland, it was about you know, providing innovative solutions for the world. You know, So the, the process is sure. important. I, I guess in terms of looking at our existing strong export sectors, Something like Scotch whisky or Scottish smoked salmon has got a very strong brand that's specifically a Scottish brand, whereas oil and gas services, for example, uh, are, are sold on their com competitive commercial basis yeah. rather than on the brand basis. Is that not the organic way that, that exports have grown and will continue to develop, rather than trying to treat everything as if it was the same? Well, well it, it is, but if you look... if, if if, if you look at the areas of success and if you look at where a brand has been developed, and I think Visit Scotland has done some, some good work in this area, and then you look at the analysis in terms of where Scotland is ranked by the various indices, we do very well in terms of our perception for tourism. So I don't think that's an accident that we have a very well-developed tourism brand and we're, we've, we do well in terms of perception for tourism. But say in innovation, for example, Scotland doesn't rank ranks are highly despite the actual track record we've got. It's not that well known. Um, and, you know, absence of any kind of brand idea in that area, I'm sure, is part of that. Thanks very much. OK, thank you. Uh, John McAlpin. Thank you very much, convener. Your, your report references the success of the Irish approach in maximising diaspora links. Um, do you think that Scotland's doing enough to capitalise on its own diaspora? No, I think that's that, that, that's something we could do. We could do much more on, and the, the structures are in place. You know, so the global Scott network, for example, um, is there. And I think we probably just don't make enough use of it. I think there are many people around the world who would be very willing to to, to to help, and but perhaps are not as engaged as they could be. Mm -hmm. I think there are quite. We've been given some figures to show there are quite a number of global Scots. I think it's about six hundred. But yeah. the feedback that we're getting is that they're not particularly used. No, and I mean, I think, um, I mean, clearly there's, a, there's an information challenge there and, uh, yeah. if you like, almost a matchmaking challenge to, to, to identify an individual who could help a particular company. Sure. But I think more could be made of that. 
What, what's your view on high profile events like Scotland Week in the USA as a, as a way to promote exports? Well, I think they're, a, they're a views in their own right and I think that they're, they're also important because they help um, they help put the issue of thinking about export in the public domain so may encourage businesses who don't currently export to at least think about it uh -huh. and so, so the more of that sort of activity um, the, the more businesses may be encouraged to, to, to think about export. Yeah. I mean, there's been quite a lot of um, you know, talk about UKTI and, and um, SDI. How do you think the agencies within Scotland work together to kind of pr promote a Team Scotland approach? Do you think it's good enough? It, it, it probably isn't, no. And it, it probably goes back to the discussion <coughs> we started on drawing on the Danish experience and how... Uh, how it's necessary to, to have a, a, a wide range of policies. So I guess every every agency tends to focus on its own area of activity. And you know, so if you're looking for expert advice, you might well go to say, say, say SDI and they might help you. But if, if you identify a training need as part of your exporting strategy, it may be more, be more difficult to access that, that, that help through, through them. So you think more, who, who should lead on that in, in bringing different different organisations together? Um, well, I mean, maybe, maybe maybe that highlights the need for an actual export strategy that's, yeah. you know, that, that feeds into the, the, the overall economic strategy. And that um, I, I don't think there's a need for one agency or one organisation to be an overall charge, but something like that then helps coordinate and make, right. make sure that every area has somebody with lead responsibility. Yeah, OK. And just finally, convener, if, if, if I may, um, your report touches on the issue of, of freight terminals, which is something that I've raised before um, in relation to the submission that the Professor Alf Baird gave to the committee. Um, he makes the point that some with our ports being privatised and uh, you're actually getting a private tax on exports in, in some ports and uh, the, in some ports the investment isn't there. Is that something that you think is a, a major problem? Um, yes, I, th I think it's probably part of a wider issue in terms of the need for more investment in infrastructure to, you know, for, for, for the practical um, matters of trade. Yeah. Um, and th that, that includes freight ports, but also includes air links as well. Right. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, reading through your report, um, I noticed that you stated the UK's share of global trade has been declining and the value of UK trade is now lower than the average large advanced economy and well behind Germany. Meanwhile, Scotland's exports have been growing and Scotland's total trade volume is equivalent to 129% of GDP. So given that Scotland's perform performing comparatively better than the rest of the UK, what would be the benefit of joining the Nordic Council? I think that was your recommendation six, if I remember yeah, correctly. Yeah, um, the, that recommendation really comes. Of, it, it, it's a bit like the point that was made about Scotland Week that um, if we if we promote the idea of internationalisation more regularly, then more people will think about it in, the, in, in their own circumstances. And I guess we were saying, well, you know, what what applies to businesses should also apply to the the government. And while while, while the per capita um, trade volumes for Scotland are higher than UK average. We kind of expect that, given we're looking at a, a, a smaller economy. They're well short of the average for a small advanced economy. And in fact, we would need trade volumes to, to increase by about 40% to match the average. Mm -hmm. um, and clearly, any strategy should seek, to, <laughs> um, should seek mm -hmm. to be above average. And I think by joining the Nordic Council, um, or applying to join the, the Nordic Council, which, which I should say includes includes both devolved territories as well as independent countries, um, w w it would be possible then to tap in some of the work that they are doing jointly, um, particularly around uh, the Green Growth Initiative, for example, where they're looking at how you know, you know, developing kind of new technologies in, in energy and in other areas um, wh where there are opportunities to collaborate across countries to, I guess it's almost back to the brand type issue, part of it's about that, so that they get the reputation for being the place to come to for those these new emerging technologies. Mm -hmm. And if we were to join the Nordic Council, would there be any adverse effects on Scotland's other key markets like USA, France and our target growth markets of India, China and Brazil? Well, I think all of these, all the, the other members of the Nordic Council would all export to those countries, which would suggest the answer is no. 
Right. And my last, my last question is about your recommendation too. It says continued access to global markets is critical with Scotland's continued membership of the European Union providing the easy, easiest access to markets. Why did you feel it was necessary to make that a recommendation? Well, clearly there's been much uh, political discussion over recent years about the uh, uh, membership of the, the EU. And it's just to make the, the point that um, both in terms of access to European markets and through the EU's agreements with, uh, with other parts of the world, um, that very much lowers the barriers to trade. And if, uh, if the position was to change, the, the barriers would become much higher and it would be far difficult for businesses to export. OK, thanks very much. Yeah, can, can, uh, when, uh, just to follow up, I want to follow up one point you said in, in response to um, Mr McDonald's first question about the, the trade volumes from Scotland. Are you measuring, when you talk about exporting, though, are you measuring trade that goes from Scotland out with the UK? We've measured both, but we've also looked at trade from Scotland with the rest of the UK, yeah. because when we're then benchmarking against other small economies, yeah. it's, it's in order to compare like with like. Right. So, but, but when you factor in Scotland's trade with the rest of the UK, how do we perform then well, relative to we're, other countries? Per capita, we're more than the UK, but far, about 40%. We're still below, behind other 40 countries. 40% below, yeah. yeah. Okay. And in fact, you know, if we took the oil, for example, out of it, then the gap is even bigger. Right. Thanks. Dennis. Yeah, thank you very much, Convener. Just to follow up uh, uh, Gordon's point, point on Europe, um, I'm just wondering, uh, do you think companies at the moment are reluctant to maybe enter into the market, the, the, maybe the potential market uh, for internationalisation because of the uncertainty uh, around the European question at the moment with the, the aspect of an in-out referendum? Do you think that's a barrier for, for them at the moment? Clearly, that's something that businesses will consider. But I'd, I'd be very surprised if uh, uh, if any business said that uh, they, they therefore wouldn't export. Um, and um, in fact, the, re uh, the reason I'm here today and not uh, not last week, I think, when you were uh, also holding a, a session on similar subjects, is that, that I was in Switzerland and th they're going through a process of uh, let, let's say a difficult negotiation with uh, the, the EU, given the referendum they had and uh, immigration and the free movement of labour. But it doesn't seem to be uh, stopping their companies uh, exporting and uh, investing in exporting activities. Okay, thank you. Check your supplementary on this, or is that no, something else? Different. Okay, I'll bring in Richard Lyle first. No. no. All right. Well, check Brody then. Okay. Good morning. Hi. Yesterday we had uh, <coughs> I chaired a session on the cross-party group on the economy uh, with EDAS and Scottish Enterprise, and one of the elements, one of three elements that we're primarily focused on was innovation. In terms of, the, and last night, the cross-party group on China, the issue of culture and connectivity and challenge was raised, and the Chinese recognised Scotland's capability, apparently, to, to innovate. But we never seem to be able to transfer that technology. What do you think the universities are doing wrong, if they're doing anything wrong, uh, not to translate R&D developments, innovation into marketable products. Do, do they understand, apart from selling education, do they understand the, the, the capability to transfer products and services other than education, which is very important? Well, well I think, actually, one thing that's worth saying as an introduction to that is if we look at our areas of strength in terms of export, and the university sector is actually one of them, you know, yep. they, they're very much global businesses. Um, today. But in terms of innovation, I mean, I think um, what, what the universities do very well is they come up with the new inventions and the, the new potential products. Um, I don't think it's really the role of the universities to turn those into marketable products. You know, that's the, that, that, that's the role of business. Um, and but Stanford and California does it. Well, well um, the, the, the primary... Successfully. Um, Stanford's done some work where it looked at how it, um, it impacts on, on Silicon Valley. And what it found is it's not so much the spin-out companies, it's actually the, it's, it's the graduates who, who make the difference. So, so it's, it's what's, what's happened there is um, it, it's the wider issue of um, how investment is secured um, and long, what's often called long-term patient finance, um, which I think is the, the centre of this issue. And that it's much more available 
um, actually often through, um, d d despite, despite the reputation for uh, um, California and Silicon Valley being venture ca capital driven, it's often public sector <laughs> funds that, uh, that provide that long term patient capital. Um, and you know the same thing you can see see in Germany, where again they're very good at taking taking the ideas and turning them into to successful companies. It's because the, the finance is there and it looks beyond a two, three, four year time frame, and it's happy to look at a return over ten or twenty years. And yeah, I, I think that's where um, where we have a gap here. But isn't it the case that our universities, just comparing with Stanford, is we have a philosophy: it's nice to do, uh, but not nice to sell. You know, the, the, the engagement in terms of equity participation, for example, by universities where they could cycle money and, 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 and generate more funding for further R&D just doesn't happen. Or well, it happens, but not to the extent that, uh, a, you know, Silicon Valley, and I spent some time there, I mean, it's, it's miles above. I, I'm sure we could learn lessons, but I think that this is where my, my, my own experience of working in other countries might, might come into it. The reason... I've been in these other countries because we're doing some work with the university sector. <laughs> and one of the reasons we were able to secure that work is because in the rest of the Europe, Europe Scotland is actually one of the places that they, they look to um, in, in, in terms of how to do things. And uh, actually, particularly in the area of not growing the technologies, but um, about how you bring them to the kind of initial market phase, how you get them out of the lab into an actual product. Um, and uh, as I said before, what we're not so good at then is taking that and turning right. it into a successful company. I, I really think that's where the gap is, rather than the, the generation of ideas. Where um, you know, I think many people around the world think the Scottish universities are very good at that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, can I just ask one other point? I thought you made an interesting point in the report about um, growth sectors and your view that. Um, the, the, the state or its agencies shouldn't be picking on particular sectors saying we'll support these to export and not others. Can you just say a little bit more about why you've come to that conclusion? Well, it's about, uh, I guess from a business perspective, um, the, the reason it's sensible to export is because we're looking at a global market. Clearly it's much bigger than a local market and therefore it's possible to focus on the areas that you're really good at um, and where, where basically you're highly productive um, Yourself. Now, it's very difficult then to, from a strategic point of view, to pick the particular sectors where that might be, might be the case because there are probably companies in every sector who mm. can do that. So you think we, the government agents should be neutral in relation to the, the sector that any particular company is in? They, they shouldn't prefer one sector over another? Well, no, they, they, where, where there should be preferences for high productivity yeah. companies. Yeah. And you know, they, might, they, might, they, they might tend to be in particular sectors. Mm -hmm. But, but it, it's not an absolute right. thing. Okay. Thank you. Okay. If there are no other questions, one follow-up? Yeah. Check yeah. yeah. On that basis, why is the Mittelstrand in Germany so successful? Well, I mean, that, that, that's a good example because they, they, they cover many different sectors. Um, and what, what's, I, I guess going back to your earlier discussion, what's quite interesting about them is many of the founders of these companies were basically inventors who'd come up with a particular product. But uh, the reason they sustain is because what they tend to do is, you know, as they go through the generations, they interact with universities in terms of pulling out the new product. And it tends to be, it tends to be based on engineering type skills, but, but they, they're in all sorts of different sectors of the economy. And again, they take this long term view about uh, returns. Harvey? Thank you. Um, good morning. Just to follow on, I suppose, from the convenience question about picking winners and your, your suggestion that that uh, shouldn't really figure uh, in the, uh, the, the, the approach to this issue. Right through your report, um, there's a pretty predictable and familiar focus purely on volume, uh, on the amount of exports, on <coughs> measuring uh, the success of our exports in narrow metrics like GDP, uh, only. Surely it's important to think about the social benefit that Scotland receives and how the economy which is going to develop and the way in which it develops aligns with public priorities. It would be uh, um, conflicting with, with current, even Scottish Government priorities, not all of which I support, uh, if, for example, uh, we saw export growth and in 
1956's uh, goal of Scotland becoming the fifth richest country in the world or whatever it is, but with the bulk of that wealth being hoarded by a very small minority of people and becoming an ever more unequal society. That would be in conflict with the government's uh, national performance framework. Uh, it would be equally undesirable if we saw only the growth of uh, forms of export which are environmentally or socially damaging in other countries or globally. Uh, why is there nothing in your report that looks at the nature rather than the scale of export and how that can be aligned to public policy priorities and the social benefit that flows from it? I think the first thing to say is I, I, I absolutely agree that, that, that these issues are important and it's uh, I guess it's almost a failure on how we, how we measure things that... Uh, what we've done in the report is is picked up in the way that th things are not normally measured because that's how you can get the international comparisons. Um, but what I would suggest is increase in exporting uh, exports is consistent with the, the two particular issues that you mentioned, because it's associated with productivity growth, which essentially is about more outputs for the same inputs. Um, therefore, increase in Productivity. I mean, it's not necessarily the case, but it can be consistent with sustainable development. And high productivity companies as well also provide, again, it's not necessarily the case, but it provides um, greater income and therefore the possibility to provide high quality jobs, reasonably well paid jobs because we're focusing the resources in those, those areas we're best at. I mean, I, I would agree with the way you've expressed it there that... Um these things open up the possibility. They don't necessarily create these social benefits, but it makes them possible. Yeah. How do you think the Scottish government, the UK government and its various agencies can ensure that those social benefits flow from increased uh, export and increased uh, internationalisation of businesses rather than merely acknowledging them as possibilities and crossing our fingers and hoping to luck? Um, I think uh, it's very difficult to ensure it, but I think the, the, the way to make it most likely is to really to keep the focus on high productivity areas. Um, and that's, that, that, that's a mechanism that, that delivers both of those things. So if the, the focus of resources are on companies which are highly productive, then I think that that's, that's the outcome that we get. I'm not quite sure that the history of what I would call late-stage capitalism bears out that, that, that parallel, but... Um, can I just ask one final question uh, on uh, APD, which I don't think has come up uh, so far, uh, and it's not mentioned in your report either. You talk about tourism uh, to some extent, and you acknowledge that there are uh, current projections that that will continue to increase, uh, including international tourism will continue to increase. You don't uh, include any recommendation on uh, APD, either in relation to the government's previous policy, its newly refined policy, or, or any other option. So, in general, would you agree with Brian Wilson when he gave us evidence uh, a few weeks back, uh, who said, uh, I don't think it makes a huge difference from a trade point of view, referring to APD, uh, and he later said that um, uh, it's not obvious to me that it's a deterrent to flying, because flying continues to increase. There is such variation in airfares that prices are affected by factors other than APD. Would you broadly agree with that line of reasoning? Well, it, it, although we don't refer to APD in this report, we have uh, N56 has previously recommended that it, it should be reduced or, or abolished because we see it as a barrier. Um, and it, while, um, while I think it's, it's true to observe that um, um, flying has increased anyway, um, it might influence where you fly to. And it might, be, it might not be an issue in terms of uh, trade and products, might, but there might well be an issue particularly for a small company seeking to um, enter export markets for the same time where they might be very cost sensitive and it, you know, it could just make the difference in some cases. I mean, Brian Wilson is the previous spokesperson the for, the, for the industry's attempt to uh, lobby against uh, 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 APD's continuation and, and he told us uh, I'm not sure I would want to transfer APD to some other tax. If someone is going to be taxed to pay for getting rid of APD, it would seem to be more of a gesture than a substantial benefit. Um, I, 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 still, I still see APD as a, as a barrier to, to, to the export and that, that, that we could lower. And okay. if, that, if the effect then is um, the, uh, more exports from highly productive companies, then the net effect could be positive in terms of environmental impacts. 
if, if, if it's high, if it's high productivity. I'd be fascinated to see the figures on that last well, comment. But, um, it's possible. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we need to call it a halt there. Thank you, Mr. Blackett, very much for coming along. And we'll have a short suspension now to allow a changeover. Right, if we can uh, reconvene, I'd like to welcome our second panel. We're joined by John Swinney, Deputy First Minister and Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Constitution and the Economy, and by Jesse Laurie, who is the Policy Manager of the European and Structural Funds Division in the Scottish Government. Welcome to you both. Uh, Mr Swinney, before we get into questions, do you want to uh, say something by way of an uh, opening statement? If I make a brief opening statement, uh, convener, the... the, the, the the government welcomes the inquiry that has been conducted by the Committee on Internationalising Scottish Business. Uh, there is a clear relevance of this inquiry to our economic strategy, which, as members will be aware, is focused on the concepts of strengthening innovation, investment, inclusive growth and internationalisation. And uh, many of the issues that are raised by the inquiry will be relevant to our further consideration of these topics. Growing and diversifying Scotland's export base um, by helping Scottish companies recognise and grasp international opportunities is essential to rebalancing the Scottish economy and improving long-term economic performance. And that concept is implicitly recognised and accepted in our economic strategy. The committee will be aware from its work on this inquiry that Scotland has many successful and growing trade links across the world. This has helped to increase Scottish exports by 20% between 2010 and 2013 giving us confidence that we are on track to achieving our target of increasing exports by 50% in value over the period 2010 to 2017. Um, whilst Scotland's overall export performance has improved since the Committee's inquiry into support for exporters and international trade back in 2010, opportunities for further growth remain. Um, the Government will, of course, consider the um, issues that are raised by the inquiry as part of that effort. Um, there are challenges that face companies in undertaking international business activity. Um, the Wilson Review of Support for Scottish Exporting identified access to finance as 
the most significant barrier faced by SMEs seeking to turn themselves into exporters. The latest SME Access to Finance report has been published today, which I believe has been shared with the committee, shows that Scottish firms seeking funding are finding it easier to access funding now than they were able to do so two years ago. Um, the government will be publishing the, uh, an updated international framework which will set out our strategic objectives as a government to enhance our global outlook, to strengthen our external relationships, to build our reputation and international attractiveness and to encourage engagement with the European Union. Um, the updated framework will set out how activity and support of these objectives will help to achieve our internationalisation goals and we are working on the, pro the production of uh, an updated trade and investment strategy to uh, build on the strategy that's in place from 2011 to 2015 and we expect that to be published in the autumn which will give us the opportunity to reflect on the issues raised by the committee's inquiry. Uh, thank you very much uh, Deputy First Minister. Um, we've got about an hour and 15 minutes uh, for the session so I would ask members if they would to keep their Questions short and to the point, and uh, answers as short and to the point would be helpful in getting through uh, the topics uh, in the time available. I think we want to look at uh, a range of issues. So I think we want to look at the uh, the Wilson review and some of the conclusions uh, from that, uh, the role of UKTI, SDI, and other agencies. Uh, look at uh, Global Scots. Um, look at the role of the universities and uh, a number of other issues that I'm sure will come up over the next a little while. Um, can I, can I just start off, um, I think there's of interest to a number of members, is, is the whole broad question of how all the government agencies uh, and other bodies inter, interact. So we've got SDI, we've got UKTI, we've got um, the Chambers of Commerce, uh, we've got SCDI, you know, all of whom have got some activity in this, in this field. And I think what we've picked up is a bit of concern about um, a lack of coordination. I mean, to give you an example, some members of the committee were in Aberdeen on Monday meeting uh, Aberdeen and Grampian Chamber of Commerce and what we found out when we were there was that they are currently running a, a trade mission uh, for their members in collaboration with London Chamber of Commerce to East Africa, to uh, Kenya and Uganda. More or less concurrently SDI is running a trade mission to East Africa, uh, to Mozambique and Tanzania and in effect these two are in competition with each other the SDI trade mission attracts a degree of public funding um, and a degree of support to its participants. The Chamber of Commerce um, trade mission doesn't. But surely there's a need for better coordination here. It doesn't make sense to have two separate organisations running trade missions to the same part of the world at the same time. What, what can be done to try and improve this? Well, I think the, the first thing I'd say, Kavira, is that the uh, I welcome the contribution that's made by a range of different organisations to encouraging and supporting uh, companies in undertaking export activity. Uh, in the four organisations that you listed, Convener, um, two of them of course are government organisations, two of them are not. Um, so the Scottish Government and the United Kingdom Government for that matter um, are not really in a position to say to organisations that are not governmental organisations you've got to do this or you've got to do that. These are organisations that make their own judgments and they're, they're welcome to do that and, 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 they, and they undertake good and useful work. Um, what I certainly think is important is that we have as much coordination as we possibly can do on the SDI UKTI uh, activity. I think you know, my sense of that is that the operational relationships work well. Uh, I'm not... You know, I'm not writing letters to UK ministers complaining about things, so that must be a reasonable measure that I think things are working all right. Um, and there's a, a, you know, a, a cooperative operational relationship there. Um, in relation to um, organisations like SCDI and the Scottish Chambers of Commerce, um, we have... Um, regular discussions with both of these organisations. I saw the Chief Executive of the Scottish Chambers of Commerce just last week. We were talking about exporting and international activity. Um, there are some um, areas of activity that individual Chambers of Commerce will wish to take forward and that's to be welcomed. I think it does get uh, uh, you know, it's a bit hard to for me to commit to the committee that I can 
draw all of that together because these are organisations who have their own agenda and they're quite entitled to pursue their own agendas. As for your point about the, the, the trade missions to East Africa, I would simply make the observation that um, you know, these are large geographies that we're talking about. Um, the different countries that uh, you raised, convener, are very large geographies with uh, many opportunities. So I, I, I think it's unlikely that um, an SDI trade mission is going to uh, inadvertently bump into the um, S, uh, the Grampian Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Aberdeen Grampian Chamber of Commerce trade mission, uh, given the size of the jurisdictions that are involved. And th there are not nearly enough um, <coughs> business connections with that part of the world in Scotland, so the more that we can encourage and facilitate, the better. OK, th thanks for that. I, I think, though, we have had examples in the past of trade missions separately led. I mean, I think there was an example we heard a few years ago about Brazil, where you had in a short time frame, two separate uh, trade missions from Scotland, one of which led by uh, a Scotland office minister and one led by a Scottish government minister at more or less the same time. So, I mean, on, on the discussion, I mean, how much coordination is there between the Scottish government and the Scotland office of the UK government in relation to ministerial engagement in trade missions? On, on the particular occasion, if I recall it correctly, Convener, and you know, I, I, I'd have to go and look at the absolutely precise transactional dates. But I'm pretty sure, if my recollection is correct, that we had a trade uh, mission set up to go to Brazil, and then the sec this Secretary of State decided to have one too. So, you know, now I simply, now, what point am I making there? I'm making the point that um, I think there has been a little bit of history, particularly in the run up to the referendum, where the Scotland office. Um, were keen to establish themselves on some of this territory. And if I can put it as delicately as that, and that's for the Scotland office to answer. I'm not here to answer for the Scotland office. They can answer for themselves, although I, I hear they stand up committees on a regular basis. Um, so um, I, I think, you know, generally we, we have a limited number of trade missions. Um, you know, we will take, you know, there are plans for ministers to undertake international engagement uh, during this year um, uh, in China, um, the likelihood in South America, perhaps also in Japan and Korea. Um, some of those will involve companies participating in those trade missions. Some will just be ministerial visits to try to encourage and to work with our people on the ground to try to expand the connections available and the opportunities for Scottish companies. Um, in all of those circumstances, we will have discussions with UKTI about the contacts we're making. You know, when I go to, if I give an example, when I go to, since the last time I was in Korea, um, the first thing I did um, when I ar arrived in Korea was to have a meeting with the United Kingdom ambassador in Korea, in Seoul. Um, around the table were UKTI people, uh, along with <coughs> our SDI staff and it was an exchange of information, points, contacts because of course UKTI might be talking to some of the people I'm talking with perfectly orderly approach uh, around about that time UK ministers were out in Korea undertaking I mean you, you know, from UK departments and from biz from uh, I think if my memory says me right, the Secretary of State for Energy was out around about the same time in Japan and Korea. Um, and, you know, we work collaboratively to take that forward. But uh, the type of the Brazil experience that you set out, convener, I would hope is the exception. OK, so you believe that that's all in the past? Well, here's hoping. OK, OK, a number of members want to come in and follow up some of these points. I'll start with Dennis Robertson. Uh, and good morning. Good morning. Um, if I may um, just focus on the Wilson Review uh, at the moment, uh, Deputy First Minister. Um, Brian Wilson, in his uh, review, suggested that we should probably go into an area of having a single portal to, to try and bring together um, what I think he described as a plethora of information that was out there. Um, what 
and, and sort of go forward on the sort of uh, Export Scotland brand. What, what's your view on the sort of single portal and the recommendations about the Export Scotland brand and maybe just on the sort of Wilson Review as a whole? I think generally the more that we can um, make it convenient and practical for companies to access consolidated, authoritative information uh, that can help them in undertake their exporting activity, uh, the better. So I think there's certainly merit in exploring the suggestion about a single portal. Where I would be, where I would be confident is that if a company is interested in exporting activity and is, it makes a connection with SDI, generally, in my experience, although I, you know, I'm sure there'll be exceptions that can prove the rule, um, those companies get a very coordinated, consolidated support service that enables them to uh, enter a particular market. And SDI might not do all of it, but they will certainly weave it together in a fashion that is useful and helpful and practical to companies. Um, but of course, obviously, and, and the committee has explored this issue, there will be a finite resource available to do such um, uh, activities. Um, so therefore, there will be companies who may not be able to access a direct SDI contact to get that market access. In those circumstances, then I think the more we can do to join up information to make it easily and readily accessible, uh, then the, the, the better. Do you see that being the sort of private sector bringing that together and owning it, or do you see it as a partnership between yourself and the private sector? Uh, I think that would be, m my view is that that should be housed by government and led by government and that we should be the, the, the anchor point for that. And um, the, the final point that Mr Robertson raised in his, in his earlier question was the, the question of the, uh, I, I think, an export from Scotland brand or, yeah, or, or yeah. export Scotland. Yeah. Um, I'm less convinced about that. Uh, I think, you know, we've got Scottish Development International out there. It's pretty well recognised within the marketplace. <coughs> I would be, I would take a lot of persuading that uh, that we should tamper with that. Yeah. And your sort of general overview uh, of the Wilson report? The, there's a generally... Um, a, 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 a pretty helpful range of suggestions there. I don't think there's, um, I don't think there's a silver bullet within it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's territory that we have been, that we've uh, explored and we continue to explore. And obviously, the thinking that's in the Wilson review will be materially considered as we formulate our trade uh, development strategy, which we'll publish in the autumn, uh, as we will consider the output of this inquiry. Uh, and you'll be aware that a group has been set up uh, um, looking at the Wilson Review uh, and some of the recommendations. And it involves the Scottish office, Scottish government, uh, involves a SDI and it involves UKTI. The question we haven't been able to get an answer to yet is who's leading this, who's chairing this group? Uh, you know, we've asked quite a few times to different parties and although the group's been set up and they've had meetings, no one seems to be able to tell us who's actually chairing it and who's taking it forward. Are you able to enlighten us on that one? Well, I think it, it, I, I, I've read the transcript of your session last week and I, I appreciate it was far from clear from the dialogue um, <laughs> who was uh, chairing it. Think, I'd encourage the committee not to be fixated by this point because yeah. I think it's actually, I don't think it, it, it you know, this is a, this is a, you know, a, a grouping of relevant uh, players in this debate who are coming round the table to try to agree some common working. Mm -hmm. um, who leads it is, in my view, like we've all got bits of this to lead. You know, mm -hmm. UKTI's got its responsibilities. We've got our responsibilities in SDI. I'm not sure what the role and purpose of the Scotland office is on all these questions because I think it's just duplicating effort that is going on. I don't understand what the particular values of the Scotland Office role in that. Um, but the Scotland Office clearly commissioned the Wilson Review and are now, uh, let's call it, convening the meetings to talk about how the Wilson Review gets taken forward. Um, but as I say, 
you know, so we're not looking at an individual, but you're saying the Scottish officer actually convening this meeting. So well, they, in well, a they, sense, they're well, leading I, I, it. Yes, but, well, no, 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 Mr. Robertson. I don't no. want words put in my mouth because no, no, I don't see no, no. because I don't see what the point is of the Scotland <laughs> ah, office okay. on this issue. I don't understand the, yeah. the value that's been added. I can understand the role of UKTI. I can understand the role of SDI. I can absolutely understand the need for those two organisations to work collectively and collaboratively together. What the Scotland office adds to the party, I have no idea. Thank you. OK. <laughs> Lewis MacDonald. That seems a very surprising uh, response, given that uh, the, the Wilson Review was indeed commissioned by the Scotland office and this working party was drawn together by the Scotland office. Does that not strike you as quite a useful contribution to the... Well, the, the, commission, the commissioning of the Wilson Review it was, you know... Is, is, a, is a welcome intervention, um, and but you know what the Scotland Office did for that was to commission the Wilson Review. Um, you know, this government's got a, a, a trade and investment strategy. We've had one. We put one together in response to the last inquiry that was undertaken on export activity by this committee. Um, it was for 2011 to 2015. Um, we are. Uh, reviewing that strategy to, 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 to reposition that in the autumn of 2015. We've got this inquiry from this committee. We'll reflect on its conclusions. We'll reflect on the conclusions of the Wilson Review. The point I'm making about the role of Scotland Office is that operationally, I cannot see what value the Scotland Office adds to what I think is a perfectly good relationship between SDI and UKTI. Is it not more that you just don't like the Scotland Office on principle and the fact that it's doing good things is just mildly irritating and, and a bit of a distraction? Well, I, I, I simply, I, I can't. If the committee, is, the committee is asking me a question, what value do I see the Scotland Office adding to the process? And my answer is I don't see any value the Scotland Office adds to the process. So, SDI, one of the things we've heard in the course of taking evidence is that in the past, uh, Scottish trade missions have had support from both Scottish Government Ministers and UK Government Ministers. Are you indicating to SDI that you don't see added value in, for example, Scotland Office Ministers supporting missions where Scottish Government Ministers are not doing so? I, I, I think, well, there's, there's plenty of UK trade missions that are taken for UK. Yeah. The point I'm trying to make, and that this committee, this committee has looked at issues about duplication and added confusion and added complication. And I'm simply making the point that as things currently stand just now, I think there's a perfectly good relationship between SDI and UKTI where we respectively take forward our interests and we're in touch with each other and we're talking about these things. And then we've also got the Scotland office mucking about in here. So um, I don't. Uh, so it's just an extra bit of the equation. What? What, what are they adding? So, so, so take, for example, a trade mission where uh, SDI is organising for Scottish companies to go abroad and to promote Scottish exports. The Scottish government is, in a position to off is not in a position to offer ministerial support. Would you encourage them or discourage them to seek support from a Scotland office minister to add value to that mission? Well, it, well it, 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 SDI will be taking forward a, a, a range of organised trade missions where they... Th you know, where they judge that yep. it's appropriate to do so and they'll make arrangements about where they think the appropriate ministerial involvement should be taken forward. Now, ministerial involvement is not required for every trade mission. Sure. Uh, it's, and, and in some cases, um, it, 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 it's, it's not appropriate for ministers because of the nature of the stage of discussions that we are in with companies and potential investors for... Um, for ministers not to be involved in that process. There is a correct and appropriate opportunity for ministers to be factored into that. So uh, not yeah. all trade missions have got to have a minister and, not, and it is not appropriate for all trade missions to have ministers. Completely accept that point. I'm simply inquiring about the position regarding Scottish, Scotland Office ministers where SDI think they might add value. Well, I, I'm, I'm not Do you have a line of, with them on I'm that? Not, I'm not aware of any circumstances where that's a risk. You can't, you're not aware of any circumstances where a ministerial involvement from Scotland Office could add value to a trade I, mission? I, I, I can't see where that could be the case because there are other trade missions that will be undertaken by UKTI that will involve UK ministers and may also involve Scotland Office ministers, for all I know, if they judge that to be appropriate. It's not just a question for me. It's a question about whether UKTI sure. see there's any point 
in the Scotland office been there. Is that not a little bit territorial too? Are you more or less saying Scotland office ministers are welcome to join UK trade missions, but not SDI if, missions? If, UK, if UKTI believe they've got any useful purpose. But, but they're not something, they're not part of the equation, in your view, for Scottish trade missions organised by SDI? Well, I, I don't have a particular, uh, I don't see particular circumstances where that's arisen, arisen in a practical or useful fashion. If I can move aside from Scotland Office to UKTI and, and, and probe, probe a couple of things there. One of the things we heard, partly in relation to the Wilson Review, but also more generally, was uh, we've heard evidences around the, the merits of co-location of SDI and UKTI uh, functions uh, in overseas markets. Uh, is, is that something you think, in, in broad terms, and, and not in every case, but in broad terms, is a, is a benefit to that co-working you've described between the two agencies? There are benefits of that happening, yes. Yeah, and, and so in terms of the further rollout, and I know you, you would like to see further SDI representation overseas, that's something you, one, one of the criteria you would consider in looking well, at options there. I think that there will be, you know, essentially there'll be areas where we attach a very high priority to market presence, and we will have a distinct SDI presence to enable that to, to be undertaken. Um, and there'll be other markets where, you know, the best will in the world, we will, not, um, uh, we will not be able to attach the priority to those particular markets. So therefore, um, some of the kind of wider collaboration with UKTI becomes ever more um, significant in the process. So, uh, but, but, you know, it, it's, it's something which brings some a uh, different helpful elements of co-location and, uh, and there are benefits that arise out of that in certain circumstances and others where uh, it makes more sense to have our own distinct presence. Thanks very much. And, and finally, coming back to the convener's initial questions around, uh, and Daniel Robertson's questions around public and, public and private uh, sector collaboration, I completely accept the point you made in, in response to an earlier question that it's not for you to instruct Chambers of Commerce or, or SEDI as to how to um, provide their services to their members. Do you think there is more that can be done to inform and engage between the public and private sectors in export promotion? Uh, yes, I think there is. Yes, uh, there, there always will be. And uh, I certainly, uh, you know, as I say, I, I very much welcome and value the contribution that's made by the uh, principally the Chambers of Commerce and um, uh, the Scottish Council for Development Industry. And I, I would. Um, you know, I would want both of these organisations to feel uh, welcome partners in the process. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, Joan McAlpin. Yes, just a, a quick supplementary. Um, Cabinet Secretary, last week Guy, Guy Warrington of UKTI w was in front of the committee and he had this to say, I think we have an excellent working relationship with SDI as we have with the Welsh and Northern Ireland governments. If people talk about lack of visibility of UKTI in Scotland, that might concern how things are branded at the point of delivery. We don't sell our products actively as UKTI in Scotland, and we rely on SDI to sell our product range, so to speak. And um, a lot of the narrative in terms of this inquiry has been about single portals and branding. And it struck me from what Guy Warrington said last week is, is that that's the way the relationship's working at the moment, it, obviously, there's always room for improvement. But if we want a Scotland brand and a, a single portal, then surely um, SDI taking the lead and maximising UKTI services under their brand is the appropriate way to go about things. I, I, I would uh, well, I, I agree with Mr. Warrington's observation, and that, that's actually that's how I feel about it. I come back to my point. If I if I if I was feeling aggrieved about the way in which we're dealing with UKTI, I'd be writing letters to UK ministers about it, and I'm not writing those letters. So, I, you know, I think the way Mr. Warrington characterised that uh, in the quote that Joe McAlpin has read out to me is how it works. It's a very pragmatic way of realising we we are able to cooperate and work with UKTI on the delivery of services um, from the perspective of the consumer, and we should always think of this from the perspective of the consumer, uh, the consumer meets somebody from SDI, they are the people that support you on exporting, whether they're been given a UKTI product or an SDI product is rather relevant to the consumer. What matters is are they getting the right product? Yes. And so uh, 
that that's where I think the you know, the benefit of the current arrangements are put in place. And UKTI um, have a you know they have a forum for coordination between themselves and the devolved administrations. SDI participate in that, and it's um, and it's a you know a perfectly good working model. Now, of course, there will be ways, and we need to look at that to make sure we that's working as effectively as it as it as it can do. But um, it generally, my feeling is that it works well. Do you just want to carry on with your other questions? Right. Okay, so certainly, then, to, to, to that point, the feedback we got in Aberdeen and, and from other businesses we've spoken to is that SDI is their main point of contact. So to have to muddy the landscape further, certainly use the resources of UKTI, but to muddy the landscape further, I don't think is what business are asking for. Um, if I could move on to asking you about the Global Scott Network. Um, it's obviously highly regarded, but there has been some evidence that the committee has taken that perhaps we could be making a little bit better use of it. Um, what's your observation of the Global Scott Network? I think I, I would say that um, two things about the Global Scott Network. First of all, is that it's a very good resource for us to have because it's people who voluntarily make their contribution to helping to boost Scotland's um, international business activity. Um, I think we could, the second thing I'd say is that I think we could use that resource more and more effectively than we do just now. Yes. And as I, you know, when I am out in different marketplaces, I do meet global <laughs> Scots who express a frustration that they feel they could do more. And mm. that's, where I've seen it, I can think of particular investments where um, either the original concept or connection of this possibly happening in Scotland has been the spark of a global Scots intervention, of mm -hmm. a global Scots saying, well, this would be a great thing to do in Scotland and I'll get you the people in front of you to make that happen. So I can think of developments where that's been the case. Um, and then I can also think of uh, developments when I've been in particular marketplaces where you know, I've been trying to persuade um, an opportunity to, be, to, to make an opportunity happen where a global Scot has been my ally in trying to make that case. Uh, but I think we could... Now, that takes a lot of... That, that's very focused because that's on a particular... Um, a, investment or a particular deal where we can clearly identify this person would be a good ally to have in making that case so let's line them up with a minister or with our staff and make that pitch for a particular investment I think that side of it works well I don't think that happens um, as comprehensively as it could uh, but then if I you know, for example I just was looking at some material the other day about um, some of the work that uh, some global Scots had done to assist us in particular marketplaces um, in, in in making pitches and and uh, and and that element of it worked uh, particularly well. Right. Okay. Would you say that perhaps is it because of a high sensitivity within the agencies um, that are liaising with the global Scots that they you sometimes get the impression from the evidence they don't want don't want everyone bothering them all the time and they're almost like overprotected in a sense that and that's why they're not used or is it just because to use them requires probably a bit more input and work? It's it, it's probably um, it's probably a bit of both that um, there will be a sense of you know we don't you know these are generally busy people so you don't want to be um, you know that there may be a particular moment where you need somebody and if you've chapped the door ten times beforehand and you know and they just don't have the time it's, it's you've maybe not used the resource appropriately. Um and secondly, um th there will be a lot of logistical work required in making this happen. But the, the these are but you know, these are not um they're not decent uh, kind of reasons why not to use global Scot the global Scot resource. Mm -hmm. I think there's plenty of capability for that to be undertaken. So do do you have any plan in place to, to sort of rectify the, the kind of the weaknesses that you've identified yourself? That, that that's essentially um it's a it's a recognised problem right. and it's and it's something that in our dialogue with SDI we've made clear 
we want to see that um, that strengthened. Right. Uh, so it's, I, I would describe it as work in progress. Okay. Do you think high profile events like Scotland Week in the US, uh, do, we, uh, do, we, do we use them enough um, to <coughs> promote exports? Because I understand that there isn't a trade delegation going out to Scotland Week this this year. I think the, the, the Scotland Week is 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 a is a, a a slightly different exercise. I think it's a you know, it's a it's an a, an awareness raising and a contact raising um, exercise. Um, but there will be plenty of business connections and contacts made in and around. Uh, Scotland Week when it takes its course. Um, I think the, 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 the value of trade missions is essentially determined by the quality of the specific connections that can be made available for individual companies. So when a trade mission is going to a marketplace, the success or otherwise of that programme will be determined by the quality of the engagements and contacts that are available for individuals to advance their business development purposes. And for that reason, trade missions have got to be very focused on the needs of the individual companies that are participating, rather than what Scotland Week is, which is more of a, a general awareness raising of Scotland, in which we then use that to try to uh, open up some new contacts and connections. Right. Is there an argument to have Scotland Weeks in other key um, target markets in the world? Emerging markets, for example. There is, I think there's a, there's certainly um, an argument for that awareness raising, and um, but I, I, I think I'd be, I, I would want to consider further the merits of more Scotland weeks. You know, they're quite resource intensive, and um, we have to be very sure. I think what, what I'm focused on is making sure that the contacts we have, we use to generate economic benefit for participating companies. Right. Do you think this, so just, sort of last, just lastly, I mean, do you think we could improve on Scotland Week then? I mean, obviously you're talking about it as an awareness raising exercise. As I understand it, there are quite a lot of different different organisations that are kind of like have claimed ownership of it in the uh, past and perhaps we could maybe make more of it. Yeah, th but I, I think there's a, th there's a lot of organisations participate and um, there is a business development focus about it. Um, there's a lot of business contacts I made during Scotland Week um, but it has a it has a more general purpose than just simply being about business development. There's a, you know, the, the Culture Secretary has made a particular effort to ensure that uh, there is a, a very extensive cultural exchange programme, and, that, and, that, and of course, some of the cultural exchange programmes are the precursor to the business development contacts and programmes. And we shouldn't be, you know, just be, you know, I can think of a number of examples where um, the process of cultural exchange and cultural appreciation has actually led to business development uh, very directly as a consequence. So there's a as a, a good avenue for okay. uh, for development there. Okay, thank you very much. Follow up from Dennis Robson. Uh, uh, thank you very much. It's just on this sort of Scotland Week aspect. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, is there more need then to focus internally, that is, within Scotland, so when there's businesses coming over, so it's more of a sort of global and international market, at home, so we take advantage of the conferences, etc., which I think we do do anyway uh, in, in many respects. But do you think we should be doing more um, in, in that way that we're actually not having to go um, a, uh, see to other uh, markets like Asia, for instance, uh, and, and Scotland Week, but actually do more at home? Uh, th there will always be a role for um, in-market presence. Um, I think th there will. I think if we rely purely and simply um, um, encouraging people to come to Scotland, I, I just don't think that's going to be sufficient to develop the relationships uh, that we require to, um, to, 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 to get economic returns. If I think uh, the committee is probably familiar that I take a particular interest in the Japanese and Korean markets, and part of what I do when I'm in those markets is actually call on some of the long-standing investors in Scotland, um, not particularly because we are, we believe they're about to make another investment, but to try to make sure they keep the ones that they've got 
which can be very fundamental. And if I think about the Okai development at Cumbernauld, um, I made a call on Okai at a particularly a difficult time for the company where they had um, a significant failing in their European business. It was leading them to consider the future of their Cumbernauld operation. Um, I was able to make a call to the company. Um, I pledged to them some joint working, which we were then able to follow up with North Lanarkshire Council, which addressed the size and scale of their premises, which were unfortunately too big for what they their current business model required and um, we averted a situation where we faced the loss of that entire facility from Cumbernauld um, it relocated it um, took on a different scale and a different way of operating but we were facing the very direct danger of losing that business out of Cumbernauld so that mm -hmm. contact and that call and that relationship was established was essential in ensuring that uh, we delivered that continuity of operation for the Okai plant. Thank you. Uh, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Just to follow up on John McAlpine's questions on the Global Scott Network, uh, no doubt it has value, but is that value not undermined uh, if uh, a member of that network ceases to be an ally, as you described them, and begins to attack and undermine Scottish interests or use their status and profile to abuse and bully Scottish citizens? Is there not a bit of weeding needing done there? Well, I, I think I think I can think of I can think of I can think of one example that perhaps um, I, I can too. I, 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 I'm sure Mr. Mr. Um, Mr. Harvey and I are thinking of the same one. Uh, obviously, in in a network of um, several hundred individuals, there will be the occasional um, difficulty that we encounter. But I think, on the whole, it's a, a very good asset for us. The, the question is whether you know somebody should continue to enjoy and and use that status uh, as being part of that network. Well, I, 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 I understand the issue that's, that that Mr. Harvey is raising, but uh, I think, from my perspective, um, I think the the, the, the network um, in its entirety has a big contribution to make, and 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 I would want to encourage it to do so. Thank okay. You. Do you, do you want to ask another question? Where, uh, well, if, where if I move on to, to yeah. the other issues I was going to raise, yeah. Um, I think the, the Deputy First Minister knows that I've been interested in the government's national performance framework since it was created. And uh, although we won't necessarily agree on every aspect of the way that pans out, I see it as a positive step uh, in terms of a broader range of economic indicators. How do we ensure, or how does the Scottish Government ensure... Uh, that the economic developments, the economic changes which arise from trade in particular and from internationalising our business uh, in Scotland contribute to the government's wider economic priorities, such as the social solidarity targets, such as the sustainability targets. How do we ensure that we don't just see uh, volume of growth of, of exports, mm. uh, but that we see a quality of that economic activity which supports social and environmental and wider economic priorities than just growth? I think the, 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 uh, it's, a, it's a very substantial issue and I think that the, the way that um, I, I can best answer it is by indicating to Mr Harvey that um, the national performance framework and the policy framework that surrounds that should be utilised as a discipline on the particular developments that we try to pursue or the particular opportun opportunities that we try to pursue. So we have to essentially ensure that there is a direct connection between what we are, um, what we are, uh, between our, our priorities and our um, commitments as a government and what is done on our behalf in terms of the identification of business development opportunities. So I think that's the that's probably the best way that I can answer that, that we have to make sure there is that constancy and consistency of action between the policy framework and what is done in, in our name. And can then you give an example of uh, the way in, a way in which the government's uh, trade and export strategy uh, attempts to ensure that our export contributes to the social solidarity target about the sharing of wealth in our society? 
I, I would, I would. A lot of our um, international activity is focused on increasing the value of employment and productive employment within Scotland. So we have a particular focus on trying to encourage and to ensure that we are successful in um, obtaining investments that will enhance the technological capability of Scotland and by its nature then improve the, uh, the, the, the levels of remuneration and the levels of productive value of employment that we have in Scotland. So I think that's perhaps the best example I can give the, uh, of how we do that. Another example would perhaps be, if, again, if I invest on my own experience, the, the largest proportion of my time in the Korean and Japanese markets have been focused on trying to pursue opportunities for investment around renewable energy, which obviously contributes towards our wider sustainability agenda, but then also on uh, life sciences, which uh, and life sciences employment by its nature tends to be higher value employment, research, intensi research intensive and uh, focused on improving wider health and well-being. So those, those type of investments and those opportunities would be central to the type of agenda that we would be pursuing. And those contacts that I'm making are based, are, are essentially very well advanced in the communication chain that SDI personnel will be taking in individual markets. The other obvious aspect to this is the Scottish Government's climate change obligations. And just last week, uh, we saw figures published by the Government indicating that the, uh, the carbon footprint of Scotland has increased uh, during the last year for which those, those figures refer, uh, increased by 5.3%, I think, the, uh, if I remember rightly. And a large part of that is around uh, our consumption patterns, the outsourced emissions which are embodied in the goods that we import. Uh, so if we export uh, uh, goods or, or services which have a high uh, embodied carbon, that will contribute to our domestic carbon inventory. If we uh, export coal, for example, because we're not burning it anymore in Scotland after next year, as it seems most likely, then that will contribute to emissions on somebody else's inventory, but it will, it will uh, contribute to our carbon footprint. Would you agree in principle that the government's export strategy and its, uh, its goals about how we change the, the nature of economic activity in and out of Scotland needs to be closely aligned to these social and environmental priorities? Uh, otherwise, it's going to fail to achieve the government's stated objectives. I, I, I believe that alignment is there. Um, and that, that was the, the foundation of my first answer to, to Mr Harvey's sequence of questions on this point. Um, and, uh, and the adherence to the policy framework that supports the national performance framework is implicit in that process. The, um, on the issue about the calculation of carbon emissions, I think we've got to be careful we don't double count here because... I, I, you know, carbon emissions are, are, are somebody's responsibility mm. and it's a question of you know, we for example will declare the carbon emissions for the consumption of goods within Scotland well, and the, their the transportation act requires, the act requires two different approaches one is about the domestic emissions inventory and the yeah. other is about the consumption based so that's the carbon footprint yeah. stuff that came out last week. So both these approaches, you're right, there's an issue about double counting, We've but both to, these approaches are valid and important. Yeah, I, and I, both I, need to be consistent with uh, yes, our international trade. I, th I think the one, uh, the, uh, one, the one caveat I'd want to put into that is we've got to be very careful we don't double count here because the, 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 the climate change targets are generally viewed, well, they're not generally, they, they are viewed as very demanding targets I think if we start putting an element of almost requiring double counting into them, they'll be even more challenging than they were to begin with. Well, this this twin track approach was agreed yeah, in the in the legislation. I, I appreciate that, but a, I think, but I think, I think, but I think in our in our analysis of all of that, we have to be careful that we properly acknowledge the the, the danger of double counting in some of that analysis. That's not to in any way escape from the fundamental obligation to meet the targets. That's that's very important. It's fundamental that we do so. Um, 
but I just think that caveat has to be understood within that. that, that Given that the acknowledgement of the need for alignment between trade policy and, and these wider objectives, I'm happy to leave it there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Jack Brody. Good morning. Uh, I wonder if I may uh, ask three brief questions. The first question perhaps will uh, <coughs> involve Miss Laurie in terms of the European funding. You mentioned, Deputy First Minister, access to finance. Uh, there are three major European funds which would help uh, uh, Scottish business. One is the Cosme Fund that would help the small businesses and get, uh, have them involved in, in export, export activity. There's the Horizon 2020 programme for R&D and innovation. And then there's the 10T, the uh, Trans-European Network Transport um, programme of 26 billion euros. Are we happy that Scotland, I know Scotland Europa has done some work on this, but are we happy that the, these funds are widely enough known in the business community and how they might uh, increase their internationalisation? Certainly the, 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 we, will, uh, we, we will want to ensure that uh, that awareness is there. I think I suppose to, to answer the question, am I satisfied there'll be perfect awareness about these issues? No, there's invariably never perfect awareness about all of these opportunities. But the government certainly will be engaged. Our uh, European team will be um, well versed in these uh, issues. There will be an integrated approach with um, different um, teams within the Scottish Government and with our, um, our wider partnerships. and every effort will be made to maximise the impact of these funds within Scotland. Okay, thank you. The second question is, is somewhat related to, to that, uh, particularly the last one, the 10T uh, networks. Uh, clearly, we have to secure movement of uh, business people, tourists, uh, uh, and also move products. If I may wrap three things together, the situation, first of all, in air passenger duty, and how you first you know, when you actually foresee us having uh, control of that in, in, in Scotland. The uh, second one, which relates to 10T, is there adequate investment in Scotland's ports uh, and transport connections? And I know that's not all within the government's gift. And the last thing, which is perhaps most contentious, at least you know, for me at this moment in time, I had the, the, the privilege, pr pleasure of working with some people in China to develop a, an economic friendship link between Dandong province and East Ayrshire, which was consummated in January this year. Uh, the protagon main protagonist from China is bringing, <coughs> or planned to bring five fellow alleged multi uh, millionaires uh, back to East Ayrshire to look at investment in April, uh, but all of their visas have just been rejected. I mean, do you have a view as to what we can do differently in terms of making sure that uh, that is not happening. It appears to be happening on a fairly regular basis. So is APD the port and transport connection and, and the whole visa issue? On, um, on APD, um, we would expect that the devolution of that power would be complete to the Scottish Government um, sometime after the 2016 Scottish parliamentary elections. Um, how far thereafter is you know, not yet clear, but I would imagine to, that I can see no good reason why that should be any later than shortly after the 2016 Scottish parliamentary election. In relation to ports, um, as Mr Brody highlights, not all of the ports are under the government's uh, control or responsibility, um, but there is certainly very active investment in, um, in a number of uh, different ports in Scotland um, and I, I've seen a number of these developments at first hand myself and, and, and they're very welcome uh, and we, we need to encourage further that, uh, that, that, that investment. And finally on the issue of, of visas, obviously um, I, I would it would be a matter of concern that people who wish to come here to invest are unable to get visas. So that there has to be, uh, I think, very good reason why that's not happened in a more cooperative way. 
Right. But without, appears, without, it, it without, appears, without the detail of that, I, I, I it don't It appears we, we had the, the last cross-party group in China, we had the UK ambassador to, to Beijing here, and it appears that, you know, quotas are it, you know, no matter what the priority is, uh, if they reach a quota, that's it, and anybody else beyond that, mm. uh, hard luck. Anyway, thank you for your... Uh, Gordon MacDonald. Thanks very much, convener. Um, earlier we heard evidence from uh, Graham Blackett of um, Bigger Economics, and he helped produce the report, the N56 report, Export-Based Growth, and that highlighted it in 2013, Scotland had a balance of trade surplus of 12 billion, compared to a UK trade deficit of 34 billion. However, we also received evidence that 60% of Scottish exports are dependent on just 100 companies. Is there concern about potential risk to future export growth by relying on such a small number of large exporters? I, I think that, that, that is a danger for us, yes. And um, for that reason, we need to encourage more companies to become involved in export activity. If I look at the, the, the growth of export activity, a lot of it has been uh, driven by the food and drink sector, and it's welcome. I do, I'm not complaining about it, but it's, 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 it's an acknowledgement of fact. And there has also been substantial growth in, um, uh, well, perhaps not so much growth, but the, the, a large, the next large component is around uh, refined petroleum and chemical products. Mm. So the, there are two very sizable elements of our export profile. Uh, obviously, the food and drink um, uh, within that category, um, whiskey will be a very substantial part of it, but there will be a multiplicity of other um, enterprises involved. Now, because one of the interesting observations I would make um, about this point in general is that I, if, if I look at my own experience of being involved in different elements of the business development process for the best part of about 25 years in Scotland and starting off originally in the private sector, um, the challenge about business development 25 years ago and encouraging um, companies to become involved in exporting was that it all seemed very far away and very difficult to do. Now, with digital connectivity, my impression of the New Start business community in Scotland is that virtually every one of them thinks they start off as a global player because the technology enables them to be a global player without really costing them very much money to establish themselves as just being there available on the internet. You know, I mm. spend a lot of time, as I think the committee knows, with the New Start business community in Scotland. I keep on talking to people who um, advertise their services through social media <coughs> and suddenly a message comes in and before they know it, I can think of one example, somebody I was talking to the other week there, um, who, who operates a, a web development company from a village in my constituency and uh, an inquiry came in and he's ended up doing website designs for various companies in Los Angeles just simply because of something he saw on social media and you know and what enables that to happen good connectivity is what enables that to happen and vision on the part of those companies so I think we, we, we are we've got better the connectivity issue really helps I think to overcome some of the practical impediments that people might have felt were obstacles to them making progress on the question of exporting um, but on Mr Macdonald's fundamental point, do we need to encourage and motivate more companies to undertake this activity? Then my answer would be yes. So what's the government's strategy to um, increase and support the number of companies, especially SMEs, so that you know we are less reliant on a uh, number of large companies for export? A large part of it will be through the channel of SDI advice and support. Um, uh, a large part of it also will be around some of the other business development interventions that we make that encourage companies to think more broadly about what they're undertaking. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the example that I cited about um, some of the New Start business community, a lot of the techniques and tactics that have been talked about within that community are encouraging people to think about exporting without needing to rely on the, the, the specific support of SDI because that resource will be finite. However much money we put in that direction, it will be a finite resource. So I think making sure that we've got that support well focused and well directed and ensuring that we have um, the, uh, the 
the, 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 the New Start community focused on encouraging companies to participate in this way, I think are a couple of the, the steps we can take to assist in this respect. Mm. A couple of weeks ago, Ian McTaggart of SCDI said, Scotland benefits from many successful and established businesses that have done it all themselves. <coughs> Although they are now beyond the need for government help, they are willing to contribute something back to the debate. How does the government intend to take advantage of this goodwill? I, th I, think, that's a, I think that's a very helpful practical suggestion. And uh, I think there are um, certainly uh, very clear mechanisms by which um, we can enable that to happen. A lot of it comes back down to the coordination of all of that effort, because by its nature it is disparate and diffuse. Mm -hmm. And we have to find the... Um, the, the, the practical ways in which we can encourage companies to make those offers and to assist. I think probably the most effective way to do that would be in direct company-to-company -company activity so that mm -hmm. um, successful exporters that don't require government support are able to share their experience and expertise mm -hmm. with other individual companies. And uh, actually the Chambers of Commerce are, um, <clears throat> are, are well placed to, to try to support some of that activity into the bargain because of the fact they have direct company networks in almost all localities within Scotland. Yeah, and we, we heard the evidence uh, from uh, Scotland Food and Drink of the benefits of an industry-led approach. And, and given that you've already said the SDI has, you know, the resources is finite. Um, you know, we heard of a number of companies that have been successful in exporting without SDI support. And certainly in terms of UKTI, um, Daniel Kaczynski, MP, uh, was uh, looking at the effectiveness of UKTI and said much of the evidence from, this was the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England in Wales, um, called the knowledge among the business community of UKTI worrying 81% of large companies that export and 69% of SME exporters are not familiar with UKTI. So m my question is that given that many companies have been successful without either SDI or UKTI support, should we not have a more industry-led approach to exporting? I think I don't think it's an either or. Um, I, I would want to get, if, if I look at the the performance on our export figures, and the fact that food and drink has comprised such a proportion of the increase that we've been able to undertake, then I, I would ascribe a lot of that to the endeavour of Scotland Food and Drink, you know, who are you know, again an, an organisation that when I go around the country, I get. To, I get uh, very strong and positive feedback about their effectiveness. So I don't think it needs to be an either-or. Um, uh, I think we should certainly um, encourage and motivate uh, different industry-led organisations to play a part in this activity. Of course, we have an extensive amount of existing industry dialogue through the industry leadership groups that Scottish Enterprise convene, and of which Scotland Food and Drink is one. And um, the, 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 there's an invaluable amount of experience and knowledge that comes from that industry dialogue that then shapes the priorities that we take forward as a, a government and as a, an organisation through SDI uh, to ensure that we're acting on the best available industry intelligence. And my final question is the N56 recommendations in the report. Uh, recommendation two was that continued access to global markets is critical with Scotland's continued membership of the European Union providing the easiest access to markets. What's the government's view on this recommendation? Yeah, I think the, the, uh, our interests lie in remaining uh, full participating members of the European Union and that uh, will be the government's position. OK, thanks very much. OK, brief follow-up from... Uh, One of the questions uh, I made that Gordon MacDonald and to which you alluded, uh, Deputy First Minister, that one of your constituents <coughs> was now developed or had developed a website uh, for someone in Los Angeles. Um, I don't wish to incur the wrath of the convener whose antipathy towards French is, is now well known, uh, but I just wonder if there might be a suggestion that we uh, encourage translation, uh, the capability of translation into foreign languages or websites, because we could do that, I understand, here. So yeah. it's not so much it's a question as a, a request. It's undoubtedly an opportunity that could be pursued. Thank you. Um, Joanne Levin. Thank you very much. One of the messages we've got so far has been um, on the importance of cooperation, which I think the Deputy First Minister would support. In that light, 
I wonder what your view is or what could be done to support colleges and universities who themselves have developed international links to ensure that local businesses where they're located benefit from that. You know, for in one locality, the college has many links abroad, and I wonder when they're mm. hosting events locally, how could that be taken forward? And do you see a role for government in that? Mm. And secondly, in relation to um, cities in particular, driving um, and supporting business, uh, internationalising business, what work has the Scottish Government done to support that or to encourage that? I think on the first point about further and higher education institutions, I, I'm completely supportive of the point that Joanne Lamont makes. Um, the, 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 the higher and further education communities are actively involved in international markets and the recruitment of students is just one example, but there will be other examples of international collaboration. And I think there's a there's a, a fine balance to be struck between um, enabling those organisations just to get on with it because they need to do that for the purposes of their own uh, recruitment operations and, 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 and purposes and trying to in any way sort of wrap around it a government message or a government wrapper of um, of what's involved, and and I think I think what I would be keen to do, and this will be part of what we explore in our international strategy, is how we can encourage various players, and it's not just about higher and further education institutions. To to go to Gordon McDonald's point, there'll be some companies that are very actively involved in the promotion of um, Scottish products overseas that we try to ensure that we're broadly communicating the same type of message about Scotland um, so that that's helping the general knowledge and awareness of Scotland and the business opportunities uh, that can be pursued in Scotland as a consequence of the presence in different markets by further and higher education institutions or companies or whoever it may be. So I think there's a, there's a job of work that and, and I have to say that the institutions themselves are very open to that discussion and that dialogue, and that's, that's very welcome. In relation to the, the second point on cities, a lot of the, well, the channel of our discussion with the cities is really through the Cities Alliance, and um, the specifically, um, I... I, 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 I I can't give Joanne Lamont a, 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 a detailed answer about any specific city-based marketing efforts, other than the fact that I know there is dialogue through the Cities Alliance with um, our enterprise agencies about how we can take forward the pursuit of opportunities within cities, because it will be it's crucial from an investment point of view that if we're out in a marketplace uh, trying to encourage investment in Scotland, that we have the best possible awareness and perspective of what the cities can offer in that process. And it's important that message is reflected in what we share and communicate more widely. I wonder, just <clears throat> to follow on from that point, Brian Wilson makes the point that we have multiple brands, we have multiple identities in relation to business. Very obvious that Glasgow has a particular pitch, for example. The Hebridean um, brand, whether it's Stormy Black Pudding or Harris Tweed, can be very strong. Equally, the UK brand and the Scottish brands are very strong. How do you see the agencies for which you've got responsibility recognising those different brands that they're not necessarily in conflict with each other, but you give a space for these different brands to be given support internationally? I think it's about making sure that we have um, a proper reflection of the strengths of Scotland, so that there are, so that those different characteristics are able to be visible in a, to to a wider audience. Um, so I don't think there's I don't think there's anything necessarily that is in conflict. We just have to make sure that there is enough appreciation of the particular strengths that we have to offer. One of the questions I answered earlier on was about. The, 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 the point about focus. I, I think we will, given the vastness of the world that is out there, the more focused we can be about what it is we're actually going after, the more chance we're going to have of finding it. So actually engaging in a dialogue with the cities or with an industrial sector 
or with individual companies about what it is they're trying to achieve will help to inform the work that SDI can take forward on behalf of those cities or in collaboration with those cities or those companies or those areas of the country um, to make sure that we maximise the, the value and the effectiveness of that contact. And how do you see collaboration and interests across in some sectors across the United Kingdom? How would you how would you see that? Well that, that would be um, you know, for example we will um, you know there will be if if I take for example um, let me take life sciences for example there's a lot of collaboration between the Scottish institutions on life sciences so they've created a Scottish Academic Health Sciences Alliance and they are prepared to essentially market come to Scotland this is what you get on life sciences and it's a very formidable proposition involving um, the Edinburgh Bywater uh, the Beechwood campus at Inverness the medical school in Dundee um, the, the, the new South Glasgow Hospital and all of its the connections with the university and the developments in stratified medicine. It is a very strong and powerful proposition. I'd have to accept that there's a competition between that proposition and other propositions within the United Kingdom that would be offered. So there is, a, there, is there a competitive tension because... If there's a life sciences investment being made by Japan somewhere around the world, well, we want to get it. And there will be... Now, what we'll try to do is minimise the areas of competition and encourage the areas of collaboration within Scotland as effectively as we can. I think it's difficult for us to do that right across the United Kingdom. But if there were individual businesses who recognised that they, they had a common interest with their business across the United Kingdom, is there a role for the Scottish Government and its agencies to support that? I mean, I think one of the big messages from business is, at one level, you know, support us but don't get in a road. And I wonder what you would see as, as would there be a role for SDI in supporting that collaboration? But it's not... I mean, I, I take your point about competition, but there will be other areas where clearly it's the interest for a pitch to be a UK-wide one. I think, the, I think the, I'd come back to my answer to Joe McAlpine's point that when a company comes to us and talks to SDI about their, 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 what their perspective is and what their horizons are, it might become apparent that there is a partnership involving a company somewhere else in the rest of the United Kingdom and the UK-TI connection is how we'll make that will join all that together and make it happen. Um, and therefore that, as a consequence of a collaboration with the Scottish and a, com a, company, and a company in England, um, as a joint proposition to an international marketplace, that would be you know, facilitated and put together by SDI and UKTI working together. And I'd be confident that the arrangements that we have in place would enable that to happen. OK, thank you. Follow up for Liz Mitchell. Thank you very much. We heard uh, this this week about the North East Scotland Trade Group, where Aberdeen Council, Aberdeenshire Council, the Chamber of Commerce, SDI, Scottish Enterprise, UKTI, the universities, and Subsea UK all work together uh, and share agendas, share information, and sometimes collaborate in missions. Is that model from Aberdeen one that you think could be usefully and successfully applied in the case of other cities or other parts of Scotland? Definitely. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I think actually, to be honest. That captures, in a sense, some of the response to the point about this all needs to be joined together and coordinated, yep. and all that goes with it. I think that's a that's a that's a very practical manifestation of how that happens. Because every one of those players has got a role to perform. You know, if if SDI is out in the international marketplace and comes up with some great idea, and they come back and they say to Aberdeen or Aberdeen Aberdeenshire Council that we'd like to get this, you know, and, and this, the, the council say, well, sorry, we've, you know, we can't get a, you know, we've not got the land for it, or, you know, Scottish Water can't provide the connection, the, 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 the connection for it, well, we've got to get, these things have got to be fixed to make that happen, so it's a perfect example of how that collaboration can work effectively. Excellent, and, and, and another thing we heard of from SDI this week was a community of practice uh, to establish, for example, a single calendar of international market events uh, across the public and private sector. Is that, again, on a Scotland-wide basis, something that the government would support those, those discussions? Uh, yeah, reaching yes, and it, and it would perhaps help to avoid the type of circumstances the convener talked about if that, if that actually was a problem, that we had two trade missions going to the same continent, albeit that they're going to sort of several big countries in 
of a large continent. Okay, Richard Lyle. Thank you. Yeah, uh, good morning, Deputy First Minister. You actually have I've covered uh, some of the points I was going to ask you, but can I go back over um, in regards to co-location? Uh, we've heard from businesses, SDI, UKTI, and the benefits of co-location of offices in overseas markets within UK embassies. Now, it's my, it's my view that we partly own the U UK embassy uh, network, um, but we don't uh, use it to full, full advantage. Uh, and some, and you, you were on about Global Scots, and you were on about the factor of going to uh, African countries where different, uh, we may not be totally located. Do we have any plans to increase our overseas offices in co-location in UK embassies? Do we have any resistance to that? Uh, or do we intend to follow up and see if we can actually improve um, and take on more offices? We will be... Um, obviously, we, 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 we keep under review the locations of the offices that we undertake. Um, there have been... Um, the expansions of the office network and the presence of SDI personnel in, you know, pers the presence of SDI personnel in India and Asia uh, today compared to five years ago will be a very significant change in presence, um, and compared to ten years ago, it will be night and day. Um, so these issues are kept under review, and um, as part of the international trade strategy that the government looks at will explore these questions further to determine whether we have the right locations. On the question of do we have any resistance to um, joint working and to um, co-location issues, uh, I'm not aware of any uh, that we have. Um, and certainly in my experience, um, again, I've, I, I, I've um, had events arranged within British embassies around the world that you know that I've hosted, and uh, with collaboration of the relevant ambassadors, and, and they've been perfectly um, a, a acceptable and well organised and, uh, and productive events. I think Mr. Lyle raises a fair point about do we use these enough, and that's perhaps an issue that we have to explore as to whether there could be more. Um, opportunities taken to try to use those resources that are clearly there. And as you know, we've, we've, as I said, we've, I've, I've been at a number of events around the world that um, have been held in, in, in UK embassies and have been, you know, very uh, successful events. And um, we are, uh, and, and we should certainly uh, consider that further as part of our the development of our strategy and our plans. Uh, I certainly welcome that because I believe that we, we partly own them. Um, but <coughs> basically, can I also uh, ask you, what other assets can Scotland use to support Scottish businesses? I think some of my answer would go back to what I said, or the issues that were raised by Joanne Lamont in her question, that I do think we we have a lot of organisations, well, Joanne Lamont and Gordon McDonald's question, we've got a lot of organisations either hiring further education institutions or companies that are out in the marketplace Along with Global Scots, I think if we if we just worked more collaboratively and collectively with all of those three areas of, of activity, we could uh, supplement significantly Scotland's international presence. And is there any other points that you would like to see this committee pursue in regards to this inquiry? I think the, 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 the key questions that um, I think affect us here are how can we... Um, achieve focus in our international activity because you could spend a lot of time generally kind of raising awareness of Scotland around the world. Uh, ironically, I think we've done a pretty good job of that over the last 12 months by a combination of the Commonwealth Games, the Ryder Cup and the referendum. So there'll be, you know, I think there'll be generally wider awareness of Scotland uh, around the world. I think what's essential in all of this is that we've got very focused efforts to produce economic benefit as a consequence and if you look at the universities and colleges that are very focused in the markets that they approach to try to recruit students and to encourage them to come to uh, this country if i look at the business development choices that we make we are looking at marketplaces to identify where do we think are the the the, the synergies that we need to develop um, my visits to Japan and Korea have predominantly been about food and drink, life sciences and renewables. 
Uh, they've not been a kind of scattergun about generally about Scotland. They've been very focused about trying to encourage those investments and those business opportunities. Uh, uh, if the convener can allow me a last question, and, and, and you mentioned uh, Japan and Korea several times and, and the efforts that you are putting in, and, and, and thank you for what you've done uh, for OKI in, in Cumbernauld and, and my region. Um, are there other countries that you think that we should develop links with that you could, or other other ministers could develop links well, with? Well, other, other ministers do that, and um, you know, I, 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 I cite the Japanese and Korean examples because I, we've taken decisions to try to establish as much continuity in ministerial dialogue as we can with particular markets, and I think that helps to build up relationships. So the the former first minister um, regularly. Um, visited China and built up sustained relationships there and those will be taken forward by our new First Minister. Um, uh, Hamza Yousaf has been active in the uh, the Pakistan market in the Middle East and has built up substantial contacts in that respect. Uh, Fiona Hislop has been active in many of the European markets and particularly also in Ireland and um, uh, Fergus Ewing has been a significantly involved given the nature of his responsibilities for the oil and gas sector in the United States, although I've also had a presence in the United States, as have, as have the, the former First Minister um, and uh, Fiona Hislop. So across a range of different ministerial portfolios, we will pursue individual markets to enhance the work that is undertaken by SDI. Thank you, Kinnear. Thank you very much. Can I just maybe ask one last question on an issue we haven't really touched on yet? And it reflects some of the evidence that we have had as a committee um, about the support for Scottish companies. It really relates to the broader issue I think the committee has looked at over a period of years about um, Scottish enterprise and HIE support for account managed companies. And we've heard about um, SDI, uh, which has supported 6,000 companies since 2012. A lot of these have been account managed companies or within priority sectors. But the evidence we heard from SCDI and the Chambers of Commerce did express some concern that this would mean that not every Scottish company would get the support they needed. So if they fell out with that key sector or fell or were not account managed, that they, they wouldn't be getting the support that they needed. How can we make sure that every company gets the support it needs, even if it doesn't meet these these, these uh, criteria? The best way to do that is by um, making sure that we have um, a, a presumption in all of the business advice that we undertake that um, is encouraging and supporting companies in undertaking export activity. You know, every company, although I, I appreciate the, the, the issues the committee has explored about the account managed system, I, I have confidence in the account managed system as, as, as giving the appropriate deep support to companies to assist them in their business development. And I think we're seeing the fruits of that um, in the returns that have been generated to the Scottish economy. But every company in the country is able to access business development advice through the business gateway. And I think what we have to make sure is that the business gateway is sufficiently equipped to provide every organisation with the foundations of how they may be able to take forward export activity. And I come back to one of my earlier answers about the atmosphere that I detect within the New Start business community in Scotland, some of which is coming out of the Business Gateway, some of which is supported by organisations like Entrepreneurial Sparks, some of it is supported by uh, the Women's Enterprise um, Network, or Women's Enterprise Scotland, I should say. Uh, all of these organisations have a uh, a, a, an emphasis and an element that's focused on exporting and international business activity. And I think it's that um, <coughs> approach that makes sure that every company can get access to some of that advice. Now, if those companies who are, let's say, are not account managers, they've gone through the business KB, if they're identified as having the necessary characteristics and strengths that could make them a successful exporter, then I would, you know, the mandate to, to SDI is that those companies have got to be supported. So that, and that's about identifying growth potential. And I think that gives us reassurance that we have the arrangements in place that can do that comprehensively. Thank you very much for that. Um, 
I think that concludes our session. On behalf of the committee, can I thank you both for coming along and for assisting us with our uh, inquiry. If I could ask members just to stay in their seats just for a moment for the next item of business, um, which is the last item in public uh, this morning. We have um, an item of subordinate legislation to consider. This is the Bankruptcy uh, Miscellaneous Amendment Scotland at Regulations 2015, uh, which is a negative instrument. Do members have any questions they wish to raise in relation to this instrument? No. In that case, are members content uh, simply to note that instrument? Agreed. That's great. Thank you. Um, at this point, we will move into private session. I'll have a short suspension. Thank you.